This particular topic is um, very much uh, an interest of mine. I've got a very, very uh, keen interest on making sure organisations have the ability to actually see what's going on from a security perspective, and that's really what I want to focus on uh, here. So a lot of people, just really to, to start this off, often ask the question, well, what is a security operations centre? Uh, and I realise all of you probably have a, a very uh, distinct view of what that might be. Um, the truth is there's not one uh, particular defined definition but I would say that a security operations centre is uh, part of your organisation which delivers uh, some of these services that I mentioned here. This is not, certainly not an exhaustive list by any means. Um, so if you like you can see it as the operational part, those of you familiar with ISMS, uh, an operational part of your information security management system. Um, as I've said, I want to focus very much on how an organisation has a, a vision of what's going on because I'm sure some of you in your experience have probably heard this line before which is uh, we've never really had a security incident, we, we don't have security problems in our organisation. Um, the classic was I, I did a, an assignment for a government organisation um, which was a, an ISO 27001 gap analysis and we presented all the findings and the chief executive basically said I like your presentation, this is all very nice but we haven't had a security problem in the 20 years I've worked here. The biggest area where they had uh, a gap was around incident management and moreover incident detection, a complete lack of that. And what I said to that particular gentleman was, no, I, I absolutely appreciate, you know, your website hasn't been defaced, you haven't had the information commissioner knocking on your door, uh, taking legal action against you. I said, but how do you know right now your data isn't being copied to removable media, isn't being emailed outside your organisation? Um, and the truth is, the honest answer was, he didn't know, because there was no uh, detective capability. Further... Uh, and again, you might well have heard this line before. Uh, many, uh, many people tell you that there's no such thing as impenetrable security. Ultimately, every single preventative control that you can possibly implement can and will be breached. And a lot of um, security people will also tell you that it's not a case of if you will get attacked. It is all of you in this room, your companies have been compromised. But have you got the ability to spot it and react to it? So in response, I see a lot of organisations are uh, building security operations centre uh, type environments. Now the truth of the matter is, many organisations may already have a level of capability. Uh, many organisations are already capturing certain events from applications, servers, network devices. So it may not be that we're starting from scratch, but the question is how do we build uh, a level of detection with multiple sources of data, with the right skill sets to know what's going on here and now in my business. So essentially, an organisation might be building a SOC from scratch, but often they're often extending some of those operational activities to get a better uh, overall view. So if you were going to build, develop, implement a security operations centre, like anything else, the, the common line that's trotted out, of course, you hear it everywhere, don't you? People, process, technology. The point is, I'm not going to focus on technology in this discussion. Um, my focus is on what are the processes we need for an effective security operations centre to take shape, and uh, what kind of people and skill sets do we need? Because the days of an analyst just sat you know, routing through logs uh, are long gone and we have a totally different uh, mindset that we need to have if we're really going to support cyber crime, cyber attacks, um, you know, in the live environment. But before people go rushing off creating uh, uh, programs of work to start monitoring their networks, applications, etc., it might be a good idea to start off by taking stock of what am I actually protecting my organisation against? Um, I.e., every organisation, whether it be government, military, uh, private sector, has different sources of threat 
to worry about, if you like. You know, different groups of people who may want to launch attacks against that organisation, who may want to steal that organisation's data or act maliciously. What you see on here is just for illustration purposes. Uh, and some of you may recognise this is a, a, an idea borrowed from a, a UK government uh, risk assessment methodology. And they argue that the first place to start is we need to sit down and look at different sources of threat, so different groups that may threaten an organisation, and consider for each threat how capable that threat group might be, in other words, what skills, what resources do they have, and more interestingly, what interest they actually have in your organisation. So when I look at the capability column, what I'm arguing is, on a scale of 0 to 5, an organisation that we're ranking up here at level 5 might be, for example, a foreign intelligence service. Lots of resources, plenty of skills, unlimited resources that they can throw at attacking an information system. Whereas, perhaps your sole journalist or member of the media has you know, less capability on, in their own right. But then you're going to ask yourself, well, okay, who of these groups, what kind of motivation have they got to attack our organisation? Am I really worried about foreign intelligence services? Is that relevant to my business? Am I more worried about organised criminality? If you take your time to think this through, it is a worthwhile exercise because if I'm going to build uh, an operation that can monitor what's going on and allow me to react, I need to know who I'm defending myself against in the first place. Now, what might happen when I build my security operations centre environment, I may get more and more intelligence on this. I might actually change my view once I start monitoring what's going on. But at least I could take an educated view before I start. Um, there are many sources out there where you can actually get intelligence, intelligence services about what kind of attacks are out there on the web and so forth. So this would be my, my starting point. Now, I said that my focus here was not to go on about technology, although the technology, of course, is really interesting, the kind of tools you can use to defend yourself. Uh, those tools are only as good as the team that works in your security operations centre. And there's a traditional viewpoint, a traditional perspective of how this should be done, and let's say a next generation perspective about what might come uh, from here. So if I start from the uh, traditional viewpoint, this, uh, this was actually taken from the Sands Institute. They have a very good white paper on building a SOC, but actually I should point out that that white paper is from about 2014, which is why I call it the traditional view. Um, and the theory goes that you would start to pull logs from different systems. So you'd configure logging in your applications, your servers, you know, firing syslogs out from your firewall switches and routers. And then you'd have a team of what I call you know, tier one analysts who basically are trained to look for certain alerts. Um, so essentially they are being alerted possibly by an alerting tool to say, hey, you know, there was a login at three o'clock in the morning or there's some fragmented IP traffic here you might want to investigate. So they were looking at individual events on a singular basis, if you like, these tier one analysts in a manual fashion possibly then escalating things, depending on certain criteria, up to a more skilled or experienced person who might have the ability to just look a little bit deeper under the hood. You know, am I actually seeing the pattern of an attack here? Am I actually seeing uh, perhaps a false positive or a, a false alert? This is the, the traditional kind of approach. And then you might then have your real technical experts, your real deep technical experts, who have really advanced knowledge of things like reverse engineering malware. So, you know, we have a malware signature alerted, spotted by the tier one analyst, uh, investigated further at the next level, and actually now you've got an experienced forensics person or a, almost an incident hunter, you might call them, who will dig deeper and really unpack the, uh, the details of that attack. And that's very interesting, uh, but it neglects something very important, and it neglects the fact that a security incident, security problem that you have in the organisation might not just be noticed through one or two alerts. Actually, you might need to piece together all kinds of activities, both technical and non-technical. So is there a number of activities taking place at once? 
do I understand how a cyber attack amounts their attack? So this is very, very useful, these roles, but I need something else as well. So, the question I might ask myself firstly about those traditional roles, which I still absolutely need to have, so I'm not saying that those have suddenly disappeared. Um, I'll come on to what do we add to this in just a moment. But the first question a lot of organisations will ask you, especially if you're building this from, from scratch, if you like, is, well, where do I actually find these individuals? Obviously, that, that the few slides you saw there require very varied skill sets, some very specialist skill sets in many cases. Um, and so simply going out and recruiting your own team or even training your own team might well be um, a challenge. So many organisations look to mix this up a little bit with, with internal employees, external employees and so forth. Um, the, the point I would make here is whether we build a SOC in-house, whether we use a service provider to help us, um, the governance of that needs to stay in-house. What I mean by that is if I'm going to build an operations centre, I need to understand my own business processes. Uh, when I'm deciding what to monitor, I need to uh, understand who's involved, how my organisation operates. So the idea of just chucking it out the door and saying to a third party, right, you just monitor our network, get on with it, just bother me when I've been attacked, doesn't really work. I've got to have a mix of the two. So I might start by um, getting business process owners on board, actually building up my own incident response plans internally, and then performing some kind of gap analysis to say, well, where are those specialist skills missing? Where are the specialists that are going to plug the gap between, say, my Tier 1 people and my Tier 3 people? And that's where many organisations are reaching out to using uh, managed uh, service security providers, managed security service providers, I should say. So there are many organisations now who are doing this because if you look at actually what you need in terms of infrastructure, training, people, etc., building a SOC, a proper working SOC for yourself can be an extremely um, extensive investment. So I was working not so long ago with a particular client who, obviously I won't name, but let's just say the initial costing of building something like this into the uh, organisation was, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. So significant investment. The good news is there are many really top quality managed security service providers out in the market who have this expertise um, already, and you can almost rent them uh, and some of their abilities as a service. But as I say, it is up to us to be careful who we choose and how we go about selecting them. Uh, and this is where maybe, not, not that it's a plug for PCB, but the likes of PCB come into the mix. Because one of PCB's jobs, of course, is to conduct audits and verify the capability of people like service providers. Uh, and later in the week, um, uh, Tim Rama, the MD at uh, PCB, will be talking to you a little bit about something called team certification. I won't steal his thunder and start talking about it now, but suffice to say that that service may be a good way for SOC organisations to prove their competence and capabilities to their customers. So that's always the question I ask, you know, uh, how do I know that they're competent? So... When I think of selecting, uh, whether it's in-house, whether I'm building a team in-house, whether I'm actually outsourcing to a third party, some of the factors you might actually want to be considering in here is what your incident response needs actually are. Now, I personally think the first bullet point, the need for 24-7 availability, speaks for itself. Unfortunately, a cyber attack uh, criminality doesn't just happen during office hours, because sometimes I hear the argument such as, well, we're only operating 9 till 5, so surely we only need a service 9 till 5. Well, actually, yeah, you might not have to tell your customers necessarily there and then that something is going wrong, but you want the ability to spot early, detect early, and intercept early. You might decide that when you build this operation, as we'll see in a moment, there are different human factors required. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a team of dedicated people permanently sat just monitoring logs. You might have people who perform those activities, and you may have people who drop in to incident response on a as-needed basis, for example, for legal advice or perhaps your human resources professionals who might advise you if you're doing an internal investigation of employees, for example, that, that requires some specialist advice and guidance. So also thinking about how we link, for example, to public relations. So 
yes, I'm not going to have a public relations person sat in my sock, but certainly I'd want to have a connection to them. So there's a lot of people on the periphery who we might need to involve on a, on a part-time basis as well. So we need to really have a very, very close think about this. But as I said a few moments ago, as you, um, humans really, the human factor is absolutely key to this. We hear a lot about uh, um, automation, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and it absolutely, as I'll point out in a few moments, has a role in helping us quickly detect your potential patterns of suspicious activity, learning what is the normal, if you will, in our organisation. But actually, that does not negate the need for qualified people who have a, a high level of expertise who can actually make that discriminating judgment. Okay? So, in order for a security operations centre to work effectively, we argue that there are some processes that need to be defined and understood. You know, uh, what are the escalation paths when certain activities are, uh, are triggered? You know, who needs to be communicating to each other and at what point? If you have, um, which you of course should have, robust business continuity plans in place, when does a cyber security incident become a major business interruption and require the intervention of your business continuity team? Those things should be defined in my processes. And if I need help with processes, uh, what a good response program looks like, there are some standards already out there that are established. Now, I'm not going to um, go over them too much in detail at this point, but you can, you can read those for yourselves. That being said, what I don't want to do is tie the hands of my, uh, my, my SOC to the point where uh, they have zero flexibility. The point is uh, cyber attacks, insider attacks, different compromises happen in all shapes and formats. So I do want a team that can use their discriminating judgment, that can be a little bit flexible. Um, so these processes are meant to be a, a, a guideline rather than absolute if this happens, you will do X, Y, and Z. We need that, that, that human factor to be there. So, thinking about the, the, the people who need to be involved then, all right, beyond your tier one, two, and three analyst, who else might, might I want to have in a security operations center to make it effective? Um, well, there's a common terminology, and some of you may have had experience with, or, with this already, the idea of what we call a red and a blue team in many organisations. So those who are, let's call it, um, defending your environment, those people who are actually monitoring what's going on, uh, looking at logs, looking at your intrusion detection, etc., typically we term them as your blue team. Okay? Their, their job is to protect your organisation, uncover suspicious activity and react to it. But how do you know you're actually capable of reacting to the most sophisticated attacks? How do you even know you're capable of spotting the most sophisticated attacks? You might have the best technology in the world, but what you might want to do is reach out and get some expertise, ethical expertise, I might add, who can actually test your blue team's capability. Um, and many organisations now are actually building those teams in-house. Uh, we refer to those as the red team, if you will. So the red team are an authorised bunch of people, they're authorised to be there, who will, uh, sometimes without announcement, actually start performing suspicious activities, almost launching real-world attacks on the organisation to test the blue team's capability to detect and respond. So it's a constant game of development, because um, if you're a blue team member, you know, you can read all you want about cyber attacks, you can put all the defences in the world that, uh, that you want, but you almost need to be on your toes, if you like, being tested every day. And that's the role of the, our red team. So essentially you have two bunches of people. Uh, sometimes they swap roles interchangeably, so they learn how to be both the, uh, let's say, the, the attacker and the defender, if you will. But that's a hugely vital part of my SOC. So it's no longer just about sitting and monitoring things. It's actually about proactively testing that on a regular basis. Not just once a year when you call the penetration tester in, but actually you know, live, continuous testing. Graham, yes, please. These, these web teams, are, are they like uh, they used to have with Netflix or chaos monsters? Are they doing um, their um, intrusion uh, or their attacks on a friendly basis? Uh, yes, they can be. It, it, what we need to make sure of is that uh, that team 
uh, has clear rules of engagement, but yes, in many cases they have the authority to perform random attacks at different times of the day, etc., unannounced. 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 So that the, you know, so you're not saying to the blue team, "Hey, we're going to do a test tomorrow at three o'clock in the afternoon." These are, it's just like a real cyber attack. I would attack happens at any time. Um, a lot of it comes down to maturity, I would say, first of all, just, just reading back a couple of steps. So I certainly wouldn't advocate, you know, uh, setting up a red team uh, and just launching indiscriminate attacks against the organisation unless I've reached a certain level of maturity. That's the first point, all right, because I want to have a, a confidence already that I'm able to handle that. How is the reaction? Well, it very much depends on the culture of the organisation. So what I mean by that is, in organisations that are embracing this, where you've got people who, you know, uh, especially a blue team, for example, that really wants to learn and develop, actually the reactions I see are usually pretty positive. It's usually the less mature organisations that get you know, maybe a little bit upset if a, you know, a problem is found, etc. Um, but this is why we sometimes interchange the team members as well. So it's not always... You know, one person trying to prove that they're smarter than somebody else. So it is a it is a two way street, I would say. Okay. Yeah, does that make sense? So yeah, please. the red team is usually internal or a third party company. Possibly a blend of both, but it's always controlled by the internal organisation. So the last company I'm thinking of working, uh, I was working with, there was three or four internal full time red team members, and then they leveraged extra resource from a service provider when they needed to. Yeah, but it's always control because you, you decide if you're going to build a red team function, you should be deciding what use cases you're going to test and how frequently and those kind of things. Yeah. All right. Um, so I might have those individuals who can keep my blue team, if you will, on its toes and, uh, and test it. Um, but actually, there's a lot more to it than that. If I think about the blue team again, I'll just switch back to them for a moment. Um, a lot of people talk about a SOC and they talk about something called security incident and event monitoring. It's a very in vogue thing at the minute. A lot of organisations are investing in tooling which can essentially pull logs from multiple sources, put together patterns and then alert somebody to say, you know, this particular event is taking place. But the truth is actually, um, the same solution isn't necessarily the be all and end all. Information about cyber attacks can come from so many different places whether it be monitoring particular types of network traffic, activity on an endpoint, so if I'm seeing you know, registry changes on a machine or access controls changing. Um, my web application firewalls can often tell me, if, I'm, if I've got web applications, whether there are you know, suspicious inputs to a web application, for example. My uh, file integrity monitoring that I might have deployed in certain environments might trigger certain alerts at certain points in time. Um, and if I'm investing in things like threat intelligence systems, which actually live monitor what's going on on the, the wider internet in terms of cyber threat, actually it's all of these things that come together that give me rich sources of data to allow a team to actually understand what's going on. But the problem is, with all this data, you could get very lost very, very quickly. If I start saying, OK, I'm going to pull logs from all of these different devices, I'm going to pull them all in one place and start looking at it. Um, actually, what I might get is so much data that the team is, is overwhelmed. Or I might get bits of data that are totally and utterly out of context. So, you know, the fact that um, I see a particular IP address of an endpoint on its own doesn't necessarily uh, mean much, perhaps, to the human analyst who sat on the other side of the fence. So what I'm trying to get at here is the... Uh, this, these rich data sets need experts who can actually manipulate those data sets, see the correlations, understand what's going on, and they need a variety of skills to do that. And it's much more than just technical skills. They need to understand things, as I'll talk about in a moment, like uh, criminal psychology, for example, having an understanding of intelligence and so forth. And this is where we see what we call the next generation SOC. Okay, this is um, taken from a HP ArcSight, obviously a very famous log management company. But what we see is the evolution of how uh, security operations centers have sort of evolved over the last few years. So 
everything I've probably been talking to up until now has probably got to this point. Okay? But where we go after this is really into the realms of things like big data, understanding vast data sets, understanding human behaviours and so forth. So we're moving into what we call now the cognitive security, which means moving beyond logs and moving into using intelligence to understand how our attackers are working, uh, the sequence of events that they use and so forth. So what we're trying to say here is we can implement our automated solutions that we've been talking about. Um, a lot of automated solutions today actually allow us to use machine learning. So, mach so essentially, rather than just alerting every time we have a certain event, you know, a lot of log management systems now can actually, over a period of time, learn the, in inverted commas, normal patterns of behaviour in your environment, learn what seems to be an anomaly, a little bit out of, uh, out of sorts. Um, this therefore takes away some of the activities of that uh, tier one analyst that you saw earlier. It doesn't mean that I don't need these analysts anymore. Uh, it just means I don't need them to do the manual uh, setting up alerts to say, you know, send me an email when somebody logs, a logs in at three o'clock in the morning. I can, I can automate all of that really. Um, so the key thing is here, whilst we've got automation, attacks are actually still carried out largely by humans or humans that have, 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 have plotted out the threat. So actually what I need my analysts to have is yes, they still need to have decent technical knowledge, but actually rather than wading through logs, we need them to have the kind of knowledge that we're talking about here. Uh, so knowledge of how uh, intelligence works, how you can actually piece together stories, knowledge of how to um, conduct surveillance, for example, in investigations, because that's what your SOC is doing. They're going to become a, an investigatory team. A knowledge of what we call criminal psychology. What I mean by that is actually understanding things like the motive, the opportunity and the means, and actually being, being able to piece together the whole story. So not just to say, I think we had a denial of service attack, and we don't know why. Hopefully our SOC will start to be able to say, yeah, we can see evidence of denial of service attack. We can see from these various other activities that are going on that we think our threat source is X. Um, and then we can identify what are our potential countermeasures in this case. Another way to look at what I'm trying to say is just a little bit of a uh, quote from, uh, from IBM that we can gather logs, 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 logs all we want. Um, but when you look at the numbers in here, they speak for themselves, I don't need to read this out, um, the systems, the automated systems will tell us so much, it's about the intelligence of the analyst to piece together the story and see the bigger picture, the human side of that picture if you like. Okay. So what we're driving at is your SOC team, no matter whether it's in-house, whether it's a, a managed security service provider, the question I'd be asking them is not just about red and blue teams, which we've talked about, I'd actually be asking them, what kind of skill sets do they ask for when they recruit their SOC analysts? And what I'm hoping to hear is things like this, that actually we have people who understand data, mathematicians, statisticians, people who can see trends and correlations, uh, you might call it data scientists, if you will. Those skills uh, are just as important, even if not so more important than being able to say reverse engineer a piece of malware. So it's that making sure I have that blend of skills in my, uh, my team. Furthermore, and really I'll, I'll, I'll open up to questions uh, uh, very, very soon. Um, we've talked about, you know, briefly we've said, well, we monitor things like applications, servers, databases, etc., all the traditional stuff that we're um, familiar with. But obviously I want my security operations center to be a, an all-encompassing tool where I can piece together what's going on across the board. So it's not just about who's logging into my server or who's remotely accessing my network. So I might want to be making sure that my SOC looks at all kinds of different things, particularly if you're into cloud services and you're using a lot of APIs, for example, to interact. You know, what's going on there? Is there any suspicious flags, perhaps, that my team need to see? And something we'll be talking about um, 
on Friday. We have a panel on the Internet of Things, so I'm not going to go too far off there to um, steal my own thunder for uh, Friday. Uh, but of course, there are more and more devices being connected to your networks, not necessarily by the IT team. So let's think about the facilities department who decides to roll out some smart light bulbs or decides to uh, roll out a CCTV system that's IP connected. And they don't consult with anybody from security, so they deploy this stuff in uh, your default mode, leaving you vulnerable and things like this. I might not be able to stop it, but if I have the ability to detect the connection of said devices very, very quickly. If I can be alerted to that, if we can respond, it will allow us to get a lot more control a lot more quickly. So being able to monitor what these endpoint devices are doing is equally as important as monitoring the activity of my users. Um, maybe some of you remember, it's going back a couple of years now, the, uh, the Target uh, attack in the US, the Target, the um, large retailer, actually had their breach because of a vulnerability in, a, in an internet-connected freezer system, for example, and it wasn't detected. Um, I want to make sure that my security operations centre has the ability to monitor all of these devices. That's my key, uh, my key aim. So I guess what we're saying, really, just as a, a few key messages, that a next-generation SOC, rather than just a normal one, um, does several things. It's not just about, as we said, logging and monitoring. It can actually do all of these things. It can collect huge amounts of data. Think of a uh, you know, data warehouse that can be manipulated. That they have the ability to detect threats from many different sources, internally and externally. That they have such a multi-skilled team that you know, those multi, multiple skilled people can actually really work together to react quickly. Um, but the one thing I probably digressed from saying a little bit is that at the end, this is still a business-focused activity. So we're not setting this environment up to, you know, have a bit of fun and do some uh, red teaming and blue teaming. It ultimately, it all comes down to looking at business processes, understanding how business works. If we're smart about this, I was actually talking to a, a colleague fairly recently who deployed this kind of idea in his organisation but actually extended it beyond security. So he was able to start monitoring other business activity uh, and feeding uh, uh, data into the counter-fraud team, for example. So once you have the ability, what I'm saying is, once you have the ability to manipulate large data sets and identify patterns, often you can add value beyond just cyber security to other parts of your business. So understanding your business is key. That's why I want the business to stay in charge of these deployments. So really, the, the final key messages, and then as I say, well, we can have plenty of discussion on this as, as, as you wish, um, is this is at the heart of your security posture. And what I mean by that is, ultimately, without these capabilities, and I know it's a bit of a bold statement I'm about to make, but without these capabilities, you're out of the game. You know, we know, as we've said repeatedly, that organisations, I'll say it again, it's not a case of if you've been attacked, if you will get attacked. It is a case of you have been, have you spotted it? And I can't say anything more strongly than that. And, and many, many security practitioners would tell you the same thing. <laughs> but also, it's not just a one-off exercise. Um, we're constantly learning, we're constantly adapting. Um, you know, cyber attacks change by the, by the, uh, the minute, you might argue. Um, this is not just a project where we can go in, set it up and rush out the door. The organisation needs to be able to sustain this in the long term. And ultimately, uh, as I've said several times, skilled people are the key here. Absolutely the, the, the key to it. Um, and I'll skip to the final point. SOC should cover all aspects of an organisation's architecture. In other words... Um, let's just spend one minute to, to say what I mean by that. Many organisations, um, you know, disciplined organisations or those with a reasonable maturity, are looking ahead at what they're doing with their technology and usually they'll have some kind of technology architecture to say this is where we'd like to be from a technology standpoint and often they'll have a security architecture that says okay over the next few years this is our target in terms of protecting that technology. Well if I'm going to design these detective capabilities and I'm going to build this, what I want to first know is, well, 
what is your security architecture? What is your technical architecture? Because again, we're not building this as a kind of a bolt-on on the side. Everything we design and set up and implement here should support your long-term and short, well, medium, short and long-term vision and indeed support your security architecture throughout. Okay. So I realise, obviously, that's a, a lot of very quick information on a topic where you, you, could, you could spend... Uh, a huge sum of time talking about it but rather than me um, sort of talking for more time perhaps um, I can take questions or have any further discussion um, so I'll hand over to you for any uh, questions yeah Franz the, uh, we have a new EU uh, directive uh, on networking information security uh, which is now rolled out maybe you should, uh, you should be in compliance this year somewhere uh, you know about it uh, I've heard some bits in the background. I don't profess to be an expert on that particular directive, but yes, I have heard about oh, this coming down the track. I wondered if you, um, if you know anything about uh, uh, how this will uh, influence the uh, maturity of uh, SOCs. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because thinking about that and indeed other standards, if I widen out my uh, point, to things like, say, um, of course, ISO 27001, PCI, and indeed NIST, all of them make remarks about actually being able to spot and detect suspicious activity. All of them talk about logging and monitoring. Um, so do I think that directive is necessarily going to prompt people to implement next-gen SOC? I, I'm not so sure about that, but certainly in order to be capable of meeting requirements of such legislation and indeed the standards I mentioned, this goes a long way to fulfilling requirements. So I think not necessarily directly, but I think indirectly organisations want to get more efficient at how they fulfil that. So I certainly think this, you know, going down this route will be a huge contributor to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I've got a gentleman here and then I'll come to you in one second. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, so what we're looking at is all systems, um, so whether we're taking, talking an operating system or a device, um, have the functionality to record certain activities. So your traditional network devices, it might be syslogs that you know, uh, um, track particular uh, traffic, for example. You know, in a Windows environment, it may be uh, security logs that I actually configure. So what I'm driving at is we need to look at each particular application and system and what data that can give us, whether it's about the usage or um, how that system is being utilised, and then piece them together to tell us a story. So that's really what I'm driving at, is system logs, particularly. Yeah. Gentleman at the front, sorry, I think yeah. you had a... So how this approach of the end user so will impact the people process, the technology stack? So for example, what the people, what the analysts, so will we have the new goals in the SOC? Or we will shift the focus not from the tier one, but the tier analysts or will be some correlation engineers or more threat hunters or we are sitting on the SIM solution and the central uh, as a technology mm -hmm. will it shift to some another one business aware solution to be integrated to the SIM something like that and the processes so will the analyst or somebody from the SOC need to have the more context to look on the business process how the system is working this business like the ERP system which is a tech Mm -hmm. or which are the additional triggers or the criteria should they verify for example what data are processing on the, on the tools so yeah. what will be the impact of that? Yeah, that's, that's that's a, yeah that's, just, that's a good question and I think um, there's, there's a number of answers to that uh, I think for, first of all a lot of the activities of the, the, the tier one analyst as you, you possibly see them today uh, will change because obviously as you say, we, we can automate a lot of the log collection activity now. We can automate a lot of the correlation activities, perhaps, that those tier one analysts were, were, were doing. So what, what I'd be expecting to see is that um, part of your SOC will indeed involve people who are defined more as a, a business analyst who will actually go out and analyse each business process, understand business process, so how are you using your ERP, what's the use cases behind those, and then 
asking that question, well, OK, well, how can those potential uh, business processes be manipulated? So it would be the business analyst, I think, providing input to the SOC about what needs to be uh, monitored. I'll give you a quick example. So I was working, doing an audit recently at a client, uh, and they're not doing this for everything. They've, they've started with quite a small SOC. But for every new project that comes along now, um, they're required to have a business analyst who maps out all of the key use cases. Uh, and then what they're actually asked to do is to come up with a, a list of key data that can be captured. And then you have somebody in the SOC who actually looks at that and pieces it together and says, OK, with that availability of data, and these are... So the business analyst starts the process and says, OK, these are the business processes, these are how they work. Then the security analyst, and, and this is the kind of data we can gather, then the security analyst off the back of that pieces together almost a security, uh, security case, if you will. And it's that security case that goes into the SOC, and the SOC then starts to set up their monitoring to spot those particular type of events. And this organisation I'm talking about is doing this for all new applications that come on stream. So one of the requirements as part of the security architecture is you must complete a, a, a SOC monitoring use case, if you like, and, and have that submitted for the monitoring. So what we'll see is I don't think the level, the level one analysts may still be there, but then I think what you're going to have is exactly that, people who have the uh, capability to understand the output in the context of those business processes. So I think it's a gradual shift, not a, an overnight revolution, if that makes sense. Time obviously here talking about detection, that's been kind of my focus here. Um, but obviously a huge, a huge role of the SOC is actually to deal with, with incident response. So what are the next, once you've detected, what are the next steps to contain that incident, to, 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 to stop that incident escalating further? So although I've neglected to sort of mention that in too much detail here, that's kind of the, the, the next thing that I would expect the SOC to be capable of doing. Yes, gentlemen here. Don't set the views in a SOC. So also for uh, extracting information, data, what is happening, and then for correcting, uh, correcting a file. So CM is of course the central one, but probably there are more. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, cer certainly. Once you've got your your CM, you, you need some uh, pretty uh, pretty robust uh, data analytics tools. So you you uh, you, you may actually. Uh, yeah, invested certain analytics tool, uh, log tracking systems, and your red and blue teams, of course, will need to be investigated various um, vulnerability assessment tools, so things like your, your, your scanners, your metasploits, uh, and all, that, all of those tool sets, because you'll need a lot of those tool sets, actually, to then go and validate whether what you're seeing is actually genuine as well. So, really, there's a whole gamut of um, security infrastructure tooling is what I'd expect to see in a, in a SOC environment. And if the company either doesn't have resources or is mm. not mature enough to have their own software? Yep. Small to medium-sized enterprises, so I'll deal with them first, they don't often have the resources to build the kind of environment that we've just been talking about here. So they will typically go down the route of investing in services from a managed security service provider. Often what that will entail, in many cases, is that the service provider will require... Um, access to the network, so you've got to have some kind of route into the network, um, and often the installation of uh, agents, basically, on, on the various machines that want to be tracked. So you do have to give a, a level of permission for your service provider to have that access. And this, without digressing from your question, is why it's the governance and oversight of what your service provider is allowed to do and the, the terms of engagement is utterly critical, because they become... Yeah, essentially a trusted insider of your organisation. So medium to small enterprises, that's what I see. You know, the, the big investments where it's in-house tends to be your real sort of large corporates who, you know, particularly the retail sector and places like that, that do face genuine, you know, repeated cyber attacks, if you will. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. Much appreciated. And... Uh...